One thing that I just kind of wanted to start with is, you know, even though Hans Kiari described both Kiari one and two, and obviously three and four, which we won't really talk about, and they do have similarities, they're, they're very distinct entities, and certainly the populations in which they occur are really distinct. So while they do have a number of things in common, it's important to sort of recognize how different they really are. And um, so even though they have very similar sounding names, they're really quite different entities. And uh, just by way of example, which you probably heard last week, you know, Chiari 1, which is gonna be much more common, uh, happens with herniation of the cerebellar tonsils versus 2, which is herniation of the vermis, you know, more centrally located anatomical structure. And most patients who have Chiari 1 don't have a lot of other uh, associated conditions. So it's not something that's part of a greater syndrome in most cases, and, and we'll pretty much stick to your more sort of bread and butter stuff in this talk tonight. Whereas Chiari 2 is universally associated with myelomeningocele, and that obviously comes with a host of other signs and symptoms and, um, and neurological malformations. The most typical symptoms that you see with a Chiari 1 are, um, you know, posterior tests of headaches. So headaches that you can bring on with coughing or sneezing, Valsalva maneuvers, laughing, playing, things like that, that are really focused in the back of the head and neck. Whereas while surgery for Chiari 2 decompression is becoming much less common than it used to be, the things that do lead to people doing it tend to be lower cranial neuropathies and brainstem dysfunction. And while you can have that with Chiari 1, that's you know, not the most common reason why we're doing those surgeries. In both of the, of the conditions though, you can have syringomyelia, you can have scoliosis. In fact, that's incredibly common in kids with myelomeningocele. Um, but kids with myelomeningocele much more often have hydrocephalus, which you have to think about in the context of managing their Chiari. Um, so it's just important to kind of recognize this. And just in terms of looking at this with imaging, you can see the patient on the left has a Chiari 1, the patient on the right has Chiari 2. And of course, they both have what you'd think about right off the bat, which is herniation of some aspect of the inferior cerebellum, the tonsils in the case of one, the vermis in the case of the other, uh, at the foramen magnum and into the um, cervical canal. However, then you start to see some differences. So while the rest of the brain of the patient with Chiari 1 is pretty normal, the patient with Chiari 2 has a number of other features that you can identify. So there's colossal dysgenesis, there's fusion of the colliculi. So that's that term beat tectum. That's what that is. You can see that the patient with the Chiari 2 has a low-lying torquil herophili. And that's very important when you think about if you're doing suboccipital decompression, you know, how much bone are you taking before you potentially can get into structures that are really critical? So that's a really surgically anatomically relevant feature for these patients. Um, and as many of you are probably already aware, there's a number of other features that you see in the brains of patients with myelomeningocele and Chiari uh, 2 as well. So things like, you know, large fused mass intermedia or interdigitated gyri and things of that nature. And then I'll just sort of briefly mention uh, Chiari 1.5 and Chiari 0 because you'll see them come up. Uh, we won't talk about them a lot as individual entities, but the processes of how they're managed are very similar to Chiari 1. So the distinction between Chiari 1 and 1.5 is really the position of the obex. So, you know, with the, with the Chiari 1, it's technically defined by herniation of the cerebellar tonsils by five millimeters below McRae's line or, you know, the line that joins the uh, the basion to the opistheon or the frame and magnum. Um, with Chiari 1.5, what you have is actually the positioning of the obex below that line. And so it's kind of a shifting of the brainstem down. And sometimes the term Chiari 5 is blended in with the term complex Chiari. And um, I think that can be a little bit of a challenge because it's just imprecision in the language. You don't necessarily know what you're talking about, but Chiari 1.5 is defined by that brainstem difference. Chiari zero, in, in my experience, has been a little bit of a Yeti. I don't think I've ever seen a patient with one. I, I haven't decompressed a patient with one, but the concept behind it is that you actually have Chiari-like physiology in a patient who doesn't have herniation of their tonsils. So you have potentially symptomatic syringomyelia uh, without actual tonsil herniation, and that can be treated by doing a posterior fossa decompression and opening up potential uh, arachnoid adhesions or something like that that's causing that type of physiology. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.